As a business-to-business marketer, your needs are unique. B2B buying cycles are long, and your customers face incredibly complex decisions. Isn't it time you had a marketing platform built specifically for you? LinkedIn ads empower marketers with solutions for you and your customers. LinkedIn ads allow you to build the right relationships, drive results, and reach your customers in a respectful environment. On LinkedIn, you'll have direct access to and build relationships with decision makers. Of the 875 million users on the network, 180 million are senior level executives, 10 million are C-level executives. You will also be able to drive results with targeting and measurement tools built specifically for B2B. And they work. Audiences exposed to brand messages on LinkedIn are six times more likely to convert. LinkedIn ads also ranked number one for security, community, and ad experience as part of Business Insider's Digital Trust Study. Here at Sway Group, LinkedIn is a pivotal part of our day-to-day and is just absolutely vital for building relationships with clients and with our employees. Make B2B marketing everything it can be and get a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash mpn to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash MPN. Terms and conditions apply. Hey, it's Jason with the Marketing Podcast Network. You have less than one month left to get special early bird pricing for the Creator Economy Expo 2023. This event, folks, is for content creators and entrepreneurs interested in building and growing their content-first businesses. Do not miss this show. Join over 500 bloggers, podcasters, authors, newsletter writers, speakers, consultants, and freelancers at the learning and networking event for content creators. Plan to attend May 1st through the 3rd in Cleveland, Ohio. Register now to secure early bird pricing before it disappears March 31st. Early bird pricing ends March 31st. As a special offer, you can get $100 off just for listening to MPN shows like this one. Go to cex.events to register. Use the coupon code MPN100. The address, the URL, cex.events. That's the whole thing. Type that into your browser. cex.events, the code you use, MPN100. The Creator Economy Expo, Cleveland, May 1st through the 3rd. See you there. Welcome to The Art of Sway. This is a podcast that brings you inside the world of marketing through the lens of influence. I'm your host, Danielle Wiley. Each week, through candid conversations with industry insiders, we will uncover how influencer marketing is making an impact across all consumer buying habits and is changing the way we talk to each other. Let's dive in. I have to say it is always fun to talk to a comedian. I loved reminiscing with Wendy about blog conferences and that one year with all of the X-rated swag. We also talked about how freeing it is as a Gen Xer to just really no longer care what anyone else thinks about what we're doing. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Wendy Ahrens is an award-winning humor writer whose work has appeared in the New Yorker Daily Shouts, McSweeney's Internet Tendency, U.S. Weekly Fashion Police, Scary Mommy, BuzzFeed, Huffington Post, Wall Street Journal, and various other outlets. She is the author of the middle-grade book Ginger Mancino, Kid Comedian, and the humorous memoir I'm Wearing Tunics Now, and a contributor to many anthologies. Her humor pieces have been performed by award-winning actresses including Uzo Aduba, Sharon Horgan, and Allison Bree of Glow. Wendy's eponymous blog was named Funniest Parenting Blog by Parents Magazine, and she was named Most Entertaining Writer at the Mom 2.0 Influencer Conference. She both speaks on and teaches humor writing to both children and adults and lives in Austin with her family. Hi, Wendy, and welcome to The Art of Sway. I'm really excited to have you on. We've kind of circled each other at various blog conferences and have a ton of the same friends. I don't know that we've spent a huge amount of time together, but this is really exciting. And you are having kind of an epic year. You have a middle grade book that just came out, Ginger Mancino, Kid Comedian, which I wish had been around when I was that age. And then selfishly, the book I'm most excited about that I actually got to devour last weekend is not coming out until the end of October, but it's called I'm Wearing Tunics Now. And that's primarily why I wanted to speak to you today. So thank you for coming on. It's great to have you. Yeah, it's so nice to see you. And thank you for wearing a tunic. I appreciate you staying on (laughs) brand for me. Any chance to dress up in a costume, I will take it. 
although this is not much of a costume. It's kind of become my everyday wear. Yes, so. as it should be. Yes. <laughs> so one of the first things I wanted to talk to you about are these relationships as Gen X women that we have formed online as I was reading your book and reading about your journey and starting to go to blog conferences and connecting with women online. I started thinking about the fact that we were really the first generation of women to do this. I mean, for our kids, certainly, and women younger than us, it's kind of standard to meet people. On, I mean, we didn't even have Tinder back in the day, but now everyone's meeting everyone online, whether it's for a relationship, a hookup, or a friendship. But for us, it was really kind of unusual. And what, I guess, just talk to me a little bit about your feelings about that and how you kind of came into it. And if it seemed strange to you, or you just kind of evolved into that. I do well say first off, off the top, I remember talking with you, I think it was at a mom too. And we were standing outside a tent where you could get your aura reading taken, because that's <laughs> what blog conferences had. And you were talking about your daughter who had started a nail art Instagram. Yes. I have a very strange memory sometimes, so I don't remember. So that was like her big, she was in like fourth grade and she started this nail art Instagram and ended up with over 50,000 followers. Oh my gosh. At one point. Yeah, it was crazy for like a nine-year-old and we made her keep it anonymous for because she was nine years old, but sure. we were just kind of like, what, what is happening? That was I'm still happening. clawing my way towards 5,000 followers after <laughs> like 35 years. I don't think uh, I'm even at a thousand. So yeah. No, but yeah, I, I write a lot about this question you just asked in I'm wearing tunics now and it details my journey. And I hate saying journey, but from being 30 years old and up until my 50s, but how my first days of motherhood, the first years of motherhood were so lonely. And I was sort of rebel without a cause when I was in the grade school years with the other moms. And I didn't think we had that much in common. And I never really found anybody I clicked with. So it was starting to write and starting a blog that led me to meet the women that I really was meant to be friends with. And it's such a, like you said, it it, we're the first generation to do that. It wasn't really, you know, something my mom would have done or could have done. And now my kids have friends all over the world that they've met online, but it was so unique to us. So I met friends who would read my blog and the really great part, and I write about this in the book, is how they liked me because of my writing voice and the personality and humor I was showing. And I was showing that on the page and not as much in real life. So they connected to that part of me that I hadn't even really acknowledged or developed yet. So they didn't like me because of who my kids were, or they didn't just see my identity as Sam and Jack's mom. They saw who I was on the inside. And as I've gotten older, that writing personality has dovetailed more with my real personality that I've been letting show more because I don't really give a shit since I'm old. But it's just been interesting. I, I met a lot of women like that at those early blogging conferences who were perhaps very unable to use their voice in their day-to-day real life, quote unquote. And then they found their group of people who let them express themselves and, you know, develop their personality like they always wished they could. Because we can't pick who the other moms at school are going to be. And, you know, and one thing I said was I was in a Texas cul-de-sac and didn't fit in with the other moms at school, but it could have happened if I was in a neighborhood in Brooklyn or at a private school in Paris. You just don't know. It's a luck of the draw. You're just with other women who reproduced around the same time you did. And all of a sudden you're stuck in this school group. So plenty of women meet their best friends for life with other moms. It just didn't happen to me. So I was thrilled that blog and that time in our lives gave us that opportunity to do something that wasn't dependent on where we lived. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I just remember just how isolating and lonely and hard it is having a baby and to be able to find people who are going through that exact, like so many of the women that I met have sons. I mean, my daughter's older, but I think my son was when I really got into blogging. And I can't tell you how many women I'm still friends with or connected with who have sons who are just about 17. Like everyone had these little baby boys at the same time and, and we're going through this and it's, a and now, you know, they're all applying to colleges and going to college. And it's, it's amazing how this journey has kind of followed us from those early terrible days of <laughs> feeling like you're never going to have time for a shower again to, 
you know, wondering if your kid's going to say hello to you (laughs) today or not. So I loved reading some of those tidbits in your book about the early blog conferences. I was trying to figure out, we both did Voices of the Year, Mm -hmm. and I could have sworn I did mine in Chicago. And I don't know if we did ours the same year, but that I was like looking at photos. I was like trying to go through photos in my Facebook, and I feel like maybe I did it in San Francisco a year before you, but we were both like oh, early wow. voices. I didn't go to that one. That's that one. I've heard of many stories of the Chicago or the San Francisco one, yeah. but I don't remember you being in Chicago. I was 2009 and I think there was another Chicago one later on too. Yeah. I think it was the first year of the voices of the year, which was 2000. Eight, but that was a crazy. Oh my gosh, that was a crazy experience. That voices of the year, because to your point, you're you know you're sitting alone and you're you're writing these words out, and certainly you're connecting with other women who are seeing the mm-hmm. real you. But to be standing on this big stage in front, you know, it was like a. I mean, I speak at conferences quite frequently, but this was like a giant show. Like I felt like like a rock star. It just felt different. It wasn't like speaking in a conference room. It was like a giant auditorium with like the lights mm-hmm. off and and to be reading your words on this stage, it was kind of a wild experience. It really was. And it, you know, I, I didn't write this. I actually just had this thought while you were talking, but it was almost like we all got our MBAs. We had these lessons like speaking in public and monetizing and all of these things that we just kind of taught each other or learned by doing or had these opportunities presented to us that we never would have had in our regular lives. So like you said, you've now spoken at conferences and other presentations and everything. And did you get those skills, you think, from the early blogging days from doing Voice of the Year? Probably not. I'm, I'm like a drama. I was like a drama geek in high school. Okay. So, so I, you were probably okay. from like doing Bye Bye Birdie in 10th grade. Yeah. Or something like that. <laughs> I never had. I was, uh, I, I don't have the performing gene. I have zero performing gene. So getting up there was terrifying. And after you do it and you do well at it, it's just such a empowering feeling. But it was doing Voices of the Year that year that led to me starting to produce and direct Listen to Your Mother in Austin, my friend and Emig show that she started. Yeah. And that was yet another way of putting myself out there. And it led to me meeting so many writers and other women in my hometown. So that was wonderful because it was another way to meet people that weren't moms at school and to express myself and to facilitate them expressing themselves. So everything in blogging, and you know, Laura Mays, the founder of Mom 2.0, she said to me once, start a blog and see what happens. And it's true because there's so many stepping stones. I mean, I could point to a particular blog post and who I met from that blog post and where that led and why I'm doing what I'm doing now. It's just amazing. I don't, I don't know if people get that opportunity anymore, but I'm so glad we did. I was just going to ask that because I think, I mean, when we started our, like every question I'm asking you was like, because we're old. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. That's again, on brand. When we started our blogs, it, I mean, I remember I went to one, like the second ever blog her. So what was that? 2006. And they were just talking about they were going to start allowing people to have banner ads on their blogs. And it was like this giant controversy and everyone was like flipping out about it. But I mean, the fact is, is that when we started blogs, starting a blog for the purpose of monetization was not, I mean, I started mine as a way to just get my feelings out and because I like writing and writing articles and submitting them to various publications was just kind of a beat down. And I had another full-time job and I just wanted an outlet. Monetizing it was not on the radar at all for me. So I don't know if if when you start it for the purpose of monetization, if that community piece kind of falls by the wayside a little bit. I think it must. And, And I saw even the generation coming up after us where they would launch their blog and already have all of that monetization in place and they'd have their social handles in place instead of learning on the fly like we did. And I tend to think that their blogs are more like the the star and the followers, the star and the fans. It's not as much of a community as we had because we were all just in the same place. If somebody left a comment on my blog, the first thing I do is click on their link and go read their blog because that's all I wanted was connection and to find other people like me. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong on that, but I don't think I don't, the generation. Is. Yeah, I don't think. I mean, I think there's still community, but certainly not within the blog space as much. I mean, people aren't leaving comments on blogs exactly. anymore. Like that's how we 
that's how we met each other and how we connected. And I mean, there's certainly communication and connection happening within Instagram or still on Twitter or, you know, on these other platforms, but it's kind of gotten distributed out and diluted a bit. A well thought out witty comment of yesteryear is now maybe like a poop emoji or, (laughs) you know. Or fighting. It's all so much fighting. And we didn't really have that then. Yeah. So that Chicago blog her where you were at Voices of the Year, that was the crazy, like the sex toys. I feel like that was, I don't know, it was almost the year that it jumped the shark for me because it became less about people connecting and getting together. And it it was very commercialized. I think that was the year that like it became very apparent that this was a thing with a lot of money and suddenly there was this giant expo hall and Trojan was a sponsor and people were throwing vibrators everywhere and shoving each other out of the way to get them and I think Amala's baby was like elbowed in the head while someone was trying to (laughs) grab a sex toy or there was just it was kind of chaos. Yeah, that was my first one that I'd attended and it was just wild and it was fun but also I had never seen anything like that before. Yeah, and I say in my book, the brands were working overtime to connect with the proto-influencers because all of a sudden, mommy bloggers, which they would say, were like a big thing that could help them. So they all showed up. And I think the organizers of Blogger did a really good job with capitalizing on the moment and you know using those people to come in and, and pay and advertise and then put that money into the conference as far as all of the parties and, and everything. I, I went to one of the last bloggers in Orlando a couple of years ago, and it was absolutely different. There yeah, were I was there no too. parties. Yeah, it was very different. So yeah. I'm glad that we had that chance to experience it at its height. It was a moment in time. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I mean, it's funny, I look at my Facebook memories and just, you know, like, so excited to see all my friends tomorrow, like just started packing and just that excitement and being being able to connect with people. And I often say that there's nothing as empowering as showing up at a mostly women blogging conference. Like nowhere in life do you show up and people are like, you look amazing. Oh my God. And the hugs and that, like, it's so affirming and filling, filling of the bucket. (laughs) Yeah. No, it is. And I say this in the book, I had my friends in place already by the time I hadn't ever met them in real life, but we we had been talking and emailing and all of that. I don't even think we had texting back then. So by the time I showed up to the first conference, it was like we'd known each other forever. And, you know, it was, that's such a rare thing. You don't get that very often. No, you really don't. I didn't kind of preview this question. So if you need a minute to think about it, but I think a lot about the fact that as I can't say mommy blogger, it just hurts me. I know, but I know. like as mom bloggers, we kind of created this monetization and kind of created like the influencer ecosphere and the creator economy. We were the first ones to do that. And now of course it's like, like just become its own big giant thing and typical Gen X fashion. I feel like it's been forgotten that we were the first ones to do it. And I read a lot of articles where folks are acting like this is a phenomenon that just started a couple of years ago and that these young influencers living in these, you know, TikTok houses in LA and And having these, you know, flashy lifestyles were the first one, like the first influencers out there. And I always kind of feel like being like, what about us? We started. (laughs) Have you noticed that? Oh, yeah, 100%. And it's fascinating to me. And I'm sure somebody's researched it or studied it more than I have. But back when we were blogging, there was hardly anybody doing it. So if I wrote something funny, it'd probably get a decent amount of attention. But now with everybody able to share, not even people who consider themselves influencers, but if you go on TikTok and Instagram video, there's some woman who's a nurse, I think, and she has like millions and millions of views for doing like just dancing and funny videos. And it's a little bit daunting to see how creative everybody is. When we started, I'm like, well, I'm really special because I got this many likes and my 
blogs are so funny, but now you're like, oh my God, everybody is funny. And people are, yeah, the TikTok houses, they're making millions of dollars. The, my son, Jack, goes to a health club not far from our home here. And we live outside of Austin. And he's been playing basketball with this kid all summer. And he said the other day, there was a middle school there for an event. And they saw this friend of Jack's and they mobbed him because it turns out he's this huge YouTube star who has 25 million followers on YouTube. Oh my gosh. And Jack didn't even know it. He Jack's 18. But it's just like, it's mind boggling that somebody who I'd never heard of, I'm sure you've never heard of him, but can have that huge of a following. And I looked him up and they say he's reported to make like half a million dollars a year. He's 23 years old. So oh yeah, I, I can't understand that. But we do definitely, to your point, don't get credit for starting it. And yeah, and we never got the 25 million followers and no, the half a million dollars a year. <laughs> It's just unfair all around. <laughs> it's all so unfair. We it's always we always unfair. get screwed. Yeah. Yeah. So we were talking a little bit about before we started recording how I got this tunic a long time ago and nothing else I bought that year would possibly fit me. But because this is a tunic, it's very forgiving. Tunics fit everything. Yes. Yep. They fix everything. They fit your whole life. And because it's the time of my life that I'm in right now, it's kind of hard to not be thinking all the time about being older and perimenopause and everything mm -hmm. changing and just feeling so out of sorts. But at the same time, and I really love this about your book, there's certainly that discomfort and just feeling like things are different and you've kind of lost control of your body and your emotions and everything. But there's also, to your point, just that having no more fucks left to give mm -hmm. about anything and just kind of living your life and like, hey, this is me, take it or leave it. And, and how empow empowering that is. I don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit about using that word again, your journey. <laughs> <laughs> My journey. But both you and I, of course, we still really have fucks to give about many things like our kids going to college and, you know, all of that stuff. But it's more of the external things. It's the worrying if I'm wearing flattering pants when I'm walking through the grocery store. I don't give a shit about that. And for m most of my life, I did give a shit about that. I was always so self-conscious about what strangers or strange men, more specifically, would think about how I looked. And then I finally got to the realization that they don't care what I look like. And even if they did care, I don't care what they think. And it's such a it's such an empowering mind shift to not worry about it. I read an anecdote in the book about going to Vegas with two friends a couple of years ago. And you, you've been to Vegas. I mean, you get harassed and there's drunk men wandering around. And I was even harassed when I was holding my husband's hand one time because it's so gross. But this time, like nobody even looked in our direction. And I could have just been like a little upset and, you know, had an ego crash. But instead, I'm like, this is amazing. This time in Vegas with nobody paying attention to us, it was empowering instead of embarrassing because I could just walk around. And as I say in the book, I felt like a man, like taking up space unapologetically. I didn't have to like, excuse me and, you know, try to sidle my way around. I'm like, I don't give a care. Or, or, I don't give a shit. I was a little bit worried I was going to get punched because I was just strutting around and, you know, had a couple of drinks in me, but I'm like, I'm here, you know, I'm, I'm walking where I want to walk and doing what I want to do. Yeah. It's, I really wish more women our age would accept that and embrace it. And, you know, we might be invisible to some, but use it to your advantage. It's, it's a great feeling and go into a club. Oh, I will say this isn't in the book, but a few years ago, I was in Vegas again with a friend and we went to a club and we sat down and the bouncer saw us and came over and had to stand up. And then he escorted us over to a dark corner of the club where <laughs> nobody else was. <laughs> Which was like humiliating, but then I'm like, oh, this is like the funniest story. So I did write a blog post about it, but I'm like, oh my God, this is like, like we're too hideous for the 25 year olds, you know, in bandage dresses. But yeah, it's just like, you have to laugh at it. Otherwise, you know, what's the alternative? Just sink into sadness and run out. Yeah, when you start to feel invisible or you realize that men or other women, if you're not into men, aren't looking your way anymore, it's really empowering and it's freeing. You know, the alternative is to run out and get a bunch of procedures or starve yourself. We've all seen that woman that is 50 and she's trying to look 20 and it's not always a good look because she's not being 
authentic. She's trying to recreate her youth. And to me, that's a fool's errand. You know, embrace the age you are. You have already been 20 once. You shouldn't try to be it again. I've been seeing kind of a lot of posts lately, and I don't know if it all started with the whole coastal grandma thing, but there seems (laughs) to be this kind of growing appreciation for aging gracefully and being okay with it. And I mean, from Jane Fonda, letting her hair go gray. I mean, it took until she was 80. (laughs) Yes, exactly. I don't know. There was something kind of making the rounds on Instagram over this weekend about appreciating how you're aging and not trying to fight it and coming into your own and being like, this is me and this is what I look like. Take it or leave it and and kind of like being okay with it and feeling empowered by it rather than kind of beaten down. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And to reinforce how I feel about it, I saw the um, Paulina Porzkova, the supermodel, yeah. she's been posting unfiltered pictures on Instagram and she's still like a million times more attractive than I ever will be or could be. But she's getting troll comments about being so old and you look horrible now. And it's like if, if she can't even win and she's, you know, she, to her credit, is embracing her age and what she looks like. So it's ridiculous. Again, a fool's errand if any of us ever tried to do that. So why? And men don't do it. They're not running out and, you know. My sister just posted a picture from her 30th high school reunion. And I glanced at it. And I'm like, who are all these old guys, all these old bald guys? I'm like, oh, my God that's who she graduated with. And they're not out there getting Botox and trying face creams and all of that. Maybe some, but I doubt it. Yeah, very few. Very few. (laughs) Quickly, before we wrap up, I wanted to talk a little bit about the fact that you kind of started with this offline writing career and then transitioned to an online writing career. And now it's kind of come full circle a little bit and gone back Mm -hmm. to offline with these two books that you have coming out, the one that's already out and then your next book coming out this fall. And you've also written for print publications. And I mean, it's kind of interesting to me to have done like the offline to online back to offline. And I wonder Mm -hmm. how that feels and what you think My offline writing was advertising copywriting for the most part, and I loved it. I I really loved advertising, and I was laid off when I was five months pregnant, which sort of sent me into the tailspin I I write about in the book. I never wanted to be a stay-at-home mom, and suddenly I was a stay-at-home mom, and I wasn't able to find a job that would pay for childcare or anything, so I wound up just kind of living the mom life and started my blog. And that has led to more opportunities for writing. And it became a writing practice because I probably stupidly thought like, I have to get a blog post out every Monday or people will get upset. Like I really treated it like a job. Like these people are waiting to hear what I have to say on Monday or they're waiting for my blog, her recap. We all were back in the day. Like I think that's were, something yeah. that's changed, but I don't, I don't think you were blowing smoke up your own ass. I think a that was bit. true. But it, you know, wound up being like a really good writing practice and it made me get much better at my writing. Then I started to, you know, I've written satire and humor for many years and I've been getting better at that. I've been placing it in more places like the New Yorker, but also because of the friends I met online through my blog and through other things, I love to collaborate. So I've been collaborating with many of them and that's led to placing even more pieces and meeting more people and the transition to, well, let me say one quick thing. You had uh, mentioned earlier how it was really hard to get into traditional media. Mm Mm-hmm. And I remember pitching a parents magazine and, you know, looking through the magazine and getting the name and all of that and emailing them and getting absolutely nowhere. And then I started my blog and in 2013, Parents Magazine named me a most funny mom blog. So I was in the magazine, but not because of the traditional path. It was because of how I just did my own thing and got recognized for it. So I think we all did that. We all adapted and just didn't take, you know, the traditional path to to getting our work seen. Another incident was when I was following a Wall Street Journal reporter on Twitter and we had become friendly because my big rule on Twitter is, you know, it's like a cocktail party and you don't run in and just yell about yourself and then run away. You engage and you, you know, I'm there to connect and to network. 
So I'd already chatted with her about other things and we were on a friendly basis. We had a friendly relationship. And one day she tweeted something about how she really loved Diet Coke. So I DM'd her. I'm like, I just, I'm not, I'm just sending you this piece I wrote because I think you'll find it funny. And it's a piece called I Love Diet Coke. That's what I read at Voices of the Year, which Uh was, again, ridiculous, but it's very funny. So she read it and messaged me back and said, this is hilarious. I just sent it to my editor and it's running in the Wall Street Journal because Coke had just bought Pepsi or there was something going on. I don't know what it was. But again, if I had tried my damnedest for years and years to get into the Wall Street Journal, I'd probably wouldn't have, but because I kind of took this other route and used the voice that I'd been developing on my own and, you know, did a good job at it and saw the opportunity to send it to her because of that. And again, I I sent it just because I thought she'd like it, not because I was asking for anything, but that led to it being in the Wall Street Journal. And she's now a good friend and is throwing my New York book party for me. So that's awesome. You know, it's just, we've been online for so long, you can kind of trace the evolution or, uh, oh, yeah, I met her because I met him that year, you know, I talk in the book about connecting and making friends. And I still do that. We don't go to the blog conferences anymore. But you can still do that in your real relationships. If you meet a woman who likes writing about historical romances and you have a friend that does that also you know introduce them to each other it's it's easy and it's just a good thing to put out into the universe I love that part of your book you talked about how you love being a connector and introducing Mm -hmm. people to each other and I think more people should do it that's really it's kind of a superpower and I admire that yeah it feels good but I, I didn't answer your question completely but it was at a mom two conference a couple years ago before the pandemic and a book editor was there to speak on a panel. And that was the year I was up on stage. Uh, the Mom 2 conferences have the Iris Awards. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you know this, but I've been the writer of the show for the past three or four years. Oh, I didn't. That's so I cool. write the script. Yeah. And that year I got up because I was presenting an award and I was tipsy to the point of almost falling off the stage, but that's not what's important. But I was uh, tipsy and being funny and, you know, had a good crowd reaction and I had met this editor there. And a couple of weeks after the conference, she emailed me and said, I had a dream that you wrote a book and I don't know what it was about, but it was really funny. So then I said, oh, maybe I should write, write a book. And that led to Tunix and she didn't end up being the publisher, but I wouldn't have written the book unless she had kind of asked me about it. So again, it all goes back to the conferences, I guess, for me, because that was me just being authentic and goofy and weird. And she happened to recognize that and read some of my writing and liked it enough to bring up a real book idea. Well, and I think it also gets back to the just being out there and not caring anymore. I mean, if you weren't out there Mm -hmm. just doing your thing and not caring what anyone thought, the opportunity wouldn't have presented itself conference or not, right? Exactly. And I walked on stage kind of drunk wearing a beauty pageant sash and a crown and being an idiot. But, you know, again, why not? Why why hide that? There's no point anymore. And if, yeah, if I'd gone out there and done a straight talk like I was talking to lawyers or something, I wouldn't have made an impression. So yeah. note to self, wear sash to next. <laughs> <laughs> So just to close this up, we have a a question that we ask all of our guests, and it's, what is the commercial you remember most from your childhood? I've been thinking about this, and I just talked with my husband about it this morning, and we both know the one that I really remember, and he's like, don't say that one, don't say that one, but I I will, of course, but the one I really remember, and I I wasn't a kid, but it was an Ikea ad about a family that moved to a new neighborhood and the kid is just miserable and he's like hi I'm new here got any dorks my age and that's uh, become something Chris and I always say like when we're starting a new thing like just walk in and say I'm new here got any dorks my age (laughs) but the awful one that I always bring up and I bring it up whenever we're traveling and we go through customs but there's this ad from when we were kids and it's like this slovenly guy going through airport customs and they say do you have anything to declare and he says yeah diarrhea <laughs> and it's an ad for, it's just terrible it's an ad for Pepto-Bismol but every time we fly and we go through customs uh, Chris will look over and see my face because I just have that like little smile on my face he's like don't you dare say it don't you dare say it <laughs> well I mean getting back to the theme of not caring what anyone thinks I really think yeah. you must say it <laughs> next time 
I don't know. I don't know if I want to risk being sent to a customs detention for being so weird. Well, thank you so much. This was delightful. And if folks want to find you, you are at Wendy Aarons, and that's Wendy with an I. Yes. So at Wendy Aarons on both Instagram and Twitter. And your website is wendyarons.com. Come. Thank you so much, Wendy, for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was really fun. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Please check back next Monday for a new episode featuring marketing conversations through the lens of influence. I am your host, Danielle Wiley, and this is The Art of Sway. You may know you're listening to this show along the Marketing Podcast Network, but did you know there are other great shows on MPN to help your business too? Caroline Kay hosts a great podcast called Snippets of Genius. Caroline, tell us what these folks will get out of listening. Snippets of Genius is a lighthearted business podcast with some brilliant insights into how you can attract and cultivate success. In each episode, I have an inspiring conversation with genius guests from the worlds of business development, marketing, design, and wellness. Each of them share their ballsy, daring moves to burst business opportunities wide open. Every episode is designed to give you as much value as possible so you can decide, define, and develop anything you want in your career or business. Hard to turn that down. Where can people subscribe? They can come on over to my website, which is www.carolineK.co forward slash podcast or find the show at marketingpodcast.net or search for Snippets of Genius wherever you get your podcasts. You heard her. Go subscribe. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts, visit marketingpodcasts.net.